Hey everybody, I'm Bob Wood and I'm here interviewing Doc Wilson. She's uh, for, for a Women's History Month here in Blythewood, March 2023. Well, I was born here in the surrounding area of Blythewood in 1946. And I was born to Alice and Boise Palmer. Uh, we lived in the lower, as we call it now, uh, Killian, between Blythewood and Killian area. So we were born here, I was born in the surrounding area, and we continued to live here at this time. You live on Boney Road now, right? Yes. Have you lived most of your life on Boney Road? Most of my life was on Boney Road, but in me, when I was growing up, we grew up on Boney Road. It was not Boney Road at that time. It was just a dirt road where we family members grew up. The Griffins and the Palmers grew up there. Well, we grew up there because that's my family. But Boney Road was just a dirt road at the time, unnamed, but later it became Boney Road. But that's where we grew up. How old were you when y'all moved to Boney Road? What to what's now Boney Road? I was probably less than 10 years old when we moved to Boney Road from down in the lower part where we were, where I was born and then moved to Rama Pond Road. And from there we moved to Boney Road. Well, let's talk briefly about your grandparents. Mm -hmm. I understand that they were very influential on you, especially Papa Bill Griffin, but tell us if you would about your grandparents. Well, my grandparents, Bill Griffin, William Bill Griffin Sr., uh, and my grandmother, Ida Griffin, were residents of Boney Road. At that time, I think they had moved from someplace up in Ridgeway that I never, I've heard talk about but didn't know. But they lived on Boney Road and they were instrumental in my life because that's, that was the creator of the Griffins and also the Palmers. Now, my, I also had Palmer grandparents as well who lived on Boney Road now, as it is called. But it was um, just the dirt road at that time. And this is Elliot Palmer you're talking Elliot about? Elliot Palmer and Lizzie Palmer. I understand that um, Mr. and Mrs. Um, Griffin and Mr. and Mrs. Palmer had farms or something that I would call today a farm. Tell us about those, they, up Boney Road. Yeah, they did have farms. Papa Bill, as we call Bill Griffin, he had a, a large acreage of farm which contained cotton and corn. And while no, they had a, a plethora of those type things that he grew. And um, they would have people to come in and pick cotton to carry to the mill or wherever they took it. But he owned that property and they had people to come in and pick the cotton so they could carry it to the mill and whatever else they did with it. But they had cornfields which sustained the families. And Grandmama Ida, she was the canning person because, because they, they sustained themselves by uh, developing and creating growing food that we needed and processing food to can so we would, the family would have a nourishment. I mean, and it was nourishable food for us. And the Palmer family, did they have the, a farm too? The Palmer family had mostly, what they grew watermelons and corn, had the field as well. And um, Papa Elliot, he was one who controlled the area in there because they had the children living on the land. Yes. I see. And this is up what we now call today Boney Road. It's, today it's Boney Road, but it was not Boney Road at And you know, they had a cornfield in the back, we call it the back field at that time. Uh, the corn field and they had a watermelon field, everybody had their own because they grew stuff because they had animals and they had horses, cows, pigs, and they killed those things to sustain the family, to keep them going. Where'd you go to church? I went to Macedonia Baptist Church and also Bethel Baptist Church because my mother was a member along with the Griffin family, which granddaddy Bill helped build the church. Macedonia. Macedonia. So we, we went to Macedonia with my mother, but my daddy and the Palmers were permanent members at Bethel Baptist Church. So my daddy was at Bethel. And Bethel is right here in downtown Blythewood. Yes. 
Okay. Macedonia is up just in South Fairfield County off of 21? Yes, right across Richland County line. Well, you mentioned your mother. Um, tell us about your mother and your father. Well, my mother was always a homemaker. She stayed home and cared, cared for us as well as the children that of some of the other parents were. My dad worked for J.R. Creech as a service station attendant. Here in downtown Blythewood. <laughs> in downtown Blythewood. Uh, he wasn't a mechanic, but he was, I'm saying, a service station attendant. And he worked there after coming out of service because my daddy was a World War II veteran. And uh, after the war, he came to Blythewood. Well, the family was from here. So he came to Blythewood and worked for Mr. Priest. That's basically the only job that I knew he had here in South Carolina because he did some traveling before selling down here. Um, and my mother, she never worked outside the house, only maybe to do some housework for some people, maybe two or three days a week. I, I don't remember a whole lot of that because she would stay home and my dad would come home every day for dinner because she would cook dinner so he could come home and have his dinner at home and come back to work. When people, before I 77, when people would come up on Highway 21 and need gas in, in Blythewood and they chose to stop at Creech's, it would be likely your father who was pumping their gas. Yes, yes. What, what, how did he feel about people and, and being a service kind of a person for people? Did he enjoy his job? I think he enjoyed his job, but you know, every now and then he would come home with some person who had racial tendencies uh, to, you know, to share that. But um, I think he enjoyed. I think he enjoyed his work. The most influential woman, woman that I know in Blythewood was uh, Miss Elizabeth Hagler. Why? She because number one because she was my aunt. She's a Griffin. She's my aunt, and she was the first black that was on town council. And I know that some things that we talked about were, you know, stressful for her to be there. Um, but she was the first black woman on town council in Blythewood. And she would always, she was a motivational person. She would always motivate you to excel and do things well. Would you encourage young women to get into politics? Uh, only if they are, in, if you have a, a love for it. If you have a love for it and you can stand the challenge, I would encourage people, young women to. Was there anybody else, another woman who you would consider to be influential here in Blythewood? Well, Miss George Francis Wilson was another lady that I thought was very influential because she accepted young black kids when they came into her store and she treated us kind with kindness and that was very important at the time because a lot of people did not, they were not kind to black kids at the time. Now, George, George Francis, Francis was. And she was a white woman. She was a white woman who, who ran a little five and dime store here in Blythewood. She was a white woman, but she was really kind to, um, to, to black children. Did you know Roger Wilson? Yes. Did he have a store? He had a store. Did you ever go over there? Yeah, well, that's where my daddy shop, and, and, and Mr. Roger would give my daddy credit so we could go to the store and purchase things during the week and pay, pay for it on the weekend. And he actually did pay his bills on the weekend. Yes, he paid his bills so we could get some more whatever daddy wanted. Well, thank you, Ms. Wood. I moved, back to, I moved back to Blythewood, and then eventually I met my husband, George Wilson, from Sherall, but that's a whole different story. <laughs> How did you, well, you could have moved to Sherall, or George could have moved to Blythewood. How did you talk him into moving to Blythewood? What's so good about Blythewood? Well, Blythewood was where the family was here, and the family had land here that we could kind of do make our home here. Did you so like Blythewood? I, I like Blythewood then. We had had some issues early on in life, but most of those were kind of resolved because race relations were progressing and we thought it would be better at the time. You wanted to leave a legacy or a statement about especially the women of Blythewood to your great grandchildren. What would you leave them with? What words would you leave them with? Um, the word that I would want to leave all of them with is love. Wow. Because I, I think if there was more love among them 
the, within the smaller community and then it would branch out to the larger community. If they would do and care for one another, compassion, that's where I am. And I'd love for my family to continue that legacy long after I'm gone. How do you teach them that other than just beating them over the head with it? Uh, show show them how you have impacted other people's lives and let them be the light that they see in you and to keep going with that. As a lady who has spent her life in service to others, mm -hmm. what would you say to the people here at the meeting tonight? Continue to work. I mean, there's a lot, there's, there's a great need. There's always need, things that need to be done in the community. I love helping the underserved. I think that's what God has called me to do, and I think I've been pretty adamant with it. You put me back. Let me ask you a question. You put me back here. I did. But the only thing that was not that I did not um, that did not get recognized is my family, my children, my children, and. My husband is here, and my children are here, and my sisters and brothers, we talked about that, but they did not come out. Right. We I'm, I'm here. Uh, Mr. Wilson. Your brother Brian calling me. <laughs> I'm here. I got you back. <laughs> We interviewed Ms. Wilson for way over two hours on an audio tape. If anybody wants to hear it, we've got it. But I would like, if you would, Ms. Wilson, tell us who your family is who's here today. You can have them even stand up if they're willing to stand up. Okay, family, stand up. My sisters, my brothers, in-laws, my grandkids, my great-grand, and that one making a whole noise. That's my youngest great-grand. <laughs> and my nieces and nephews. station attendant on Highway 21. That's that's the main breadwinner in her family was a filling station attendant. Yes. Her mother worked at home raising a family, I'm sorry about microphone, raising a family and cooking and stuff like that. So this lady here who is the daughter of a filling station attendant with a big family then got a real education, worked downtown with the Chamber of Commerce and we had what we saw on the screen just a few minutes ago. If she can do that, anybody can do that. And I think that's pretty amazing. And that was my question. <laughs> Andrea's here. Um, I got your name right. Adrian. Adrian. I'm, I'm so sorry. Stand up, Adrian. Now, this is your only chance for the rest of your life to ask uh, Ms. Wilson a question. Okay. So, Ms. Wilson. <laughs> Mother. Mother. First of all. <laughs> I'm the only daughter, and so I can say with um, with great confidence that my mom is the oldest granddaughter of her mom, who was the oldest of 12. And because of that, she was the one who always spanked everybody, right there. <laughs> <laughs> we call her grand. So she's carrying on a legacy that's goes way back. I'm going to ask her how is she going to push that legacy forward to that one who's making all the right. <laughs> That's your question. I have no earthly idea. I have no earthly idea. I think things are changing so much right now from where I was in the 60s and 70s. Where they are now. I will be moving in anyway. Memphis, <laughs> this morning in Sunday school, that um, Memphis will be, will have changed so much by the time she's grown until I just don't know what to say. So just do the best you can and just do <laughs> love and joke as much as you can. But I also have my one of my aunts here, Miss um, Benson. She's here. That's the oldest. 
matriarch in the prison family. Where's Miss Simpson? There she is. Benson. school we had a school teacher named Miss Hennett and she was from Ridgeway and she would stop and pick us up on the way home because we didn't live quite a mile from the school but if we walked up the hill we could get on the bus okay. and then of course daddy took us some but um but it was interesting uh, living out in the country because you had you had different things than the kids in the city have yeah. uh, different forms of entertainment uh, you didn't sit up and watch TV all day. Of course, I understand my daddy was the first man in life with the TV. And Lonnie Nelson is the one that told me that. Oh, The yeah. Lonnie B. Nelson School? Yes. Yeah, us, yeah, he's the one that told me that. Oh, that's great. And uh, he said that we had the first TV and that people would go up on Friday nights and watch the fights, the boxing yeah, <laughs> on TV. So, yeah. uh, But we just had things that entertained us outside. Um, I grew up on a chicken farm. So your grandparents were yeah, farmers. Yeah, my grandparents were the larger farmers, yes. But my daddy had this Oliver Tratner, and it's still up at my brother's house. An old Oliver tra Tratner now, but it was it was new back then. And he would love to ride on the track a little bit. And he would help granddaddy in the plow sometimes. And uh, he and my granddaddy had a sawmill together. Mm -hmm. uh, that was part of his business. The chicken farm was part of it, and then the sawmill was part of it. Right. And so we loved going on the weekends. Now, back in the days that he had the sawmill, uh, it's when you used mule power. You didn't have truck power or skitter power or anything like that. You used mules. Mm -hmm. And the guys would go up and cut the trees and then they would hook the chains around them and drag them to the sawmill. And so the mules had to be fed and watered on the weekends. And we would go over and uh, you moved your sawmill from place to place then. Mm -hmm. uh, matter of fact, my husband remembers when my daddy had the sawmill down on Mr. Barnett's place near him. And he would go over and, uh, and watch them and talk to them and everything. He was a, kind of an outgoing little fellow anyway. Mm -hmm. And uh, he would tell, uh, tell my children the stories of that and, uh, and go and just enjoy watching them sawmill. But on the weekends when we'd go and feed the mules, uh, we just played around while Daddy fed the mules, and we loved to get in the sawdust pile. They had these gigantic sawdust piles, you know, and we loved to get in there and play and make a mess. But if you had a creek anywhere near it, okay. we would go play in the creek. And I remember one time on a Sunday afternoon, we went and played in the creek and had the most fun. And then the next day when Daddy came home from work, he said, guess what I killed in the, re in the creek today? And it was a great big old snake, a poisonous snake. Mm -hmm. And so we weren't as up on playing at the creeks after that. But, right, right. but we did love doing the things like that. And your parents did things with you then. Yeah, you know, a yeah. lot of things with you, which they do now, but mm -hmm. um, they did um, the different kinds of things from what they do now. They didn't take you somewhere to entertain you. They took you wherever, somewhere like the sawmill to entertain you where you could play in the creek. Right, yeah, Things of that work. nature. <laughs> yeah, and my, my grandfather that lived beside us had several ponds. Mm -hmm. 
the Jennings used to have their hair rides, I mean, their trail rides over at uh, Granddaddy's Pond a lot. But we swam in the ponds, mm -hmm. and they were clean back then, and we really enjoyed it. I think it's interesting that your grandfather raised cattle to support Fort Jackson. Yes, and back at, during the war times, um, he raised the cattle and sold them to Fort Jackson for the soldiers. That's great. Yeah. That's great. So did you guys ever ride the train? You know, I never did. That's mm -hmm. uh, we watched it, and of course, any time that, that something we could see it from our house, right? And any time that something like the circus of things like that would come, sometimes, and, and we would love to watch uh, the trains and watch things like that go by, mm -hmm. and then sometimes they let you know ahead of time they were coming through the town, and so you would watch out for them. It, I started in the, I think the eighth grade, uh -huh. and. Um, the first year that I played, I didn't play as much. Mm -hmm. And then the second year, my sister played as well. Mm -hmm. She was a senior and I was in the ninth grade. And so we played first string together. And a uh, matter of fact, lots of times now when I'm trying to go to sleep at night and I, and I have a hard time going to sleep, I think, okay, Ada, let's play some basketball. Yeah. And I'll try to remember the things that we did and it's so much fun, you know, remembering yeah. that. So. Yeah, that's but, neat. Yeah, she and I were very close because my older sister, she went to college when she was 17. And so she was five years older than me almost. Mm -hmm. And so Adele and I were the two that were close. But she was a good basketball player. She she made the she made more points in most of the games than anyone else. Of course back then we only played the half court. Mm -hmm. You had three forwards on one end and three guards on the other. You could not cross the center line. Okay. And the other team had the three forwards with your guards. I mean three guards on the other end. They had three forwards with your guards, and then we had three forwards with their guards. Mm -hmm. It was much simpler back then. You didn't run full court. Right. And, right. Um, and I held the high score. I had, and it was, of course, against playing in high school, and they weren't the oh. best team. <laughs> but I had 36 <laughs> points in a game, and I held that record for a while until Mary Ellen Reigns came across and she <laughs> broke my record. So <laughs> <laughs> I guess she probably still holds that record because they didn't. So uh, they closed the school, the high school, in 1970. Mm -hmm. so. Yes, and that was the original Blackwood High School. Yes, original Blackwood so, High School. I yeah. went the whole way through. Now, I quit early and got married, which okay. you know that story. So. Yes, but, yes. Uh, we ran off and got married. We eloped, I guess. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So, and you guys still farm. You're farming today, <laughs> actually. <laughs> yes. You know? Yes, um, we still are. Um, well, Joe passed away about a year and a half ago, mm -hmm. and we had the grapevines. He loved his grapevines. And... Um, I take care of the grapevines, and my son, Aubrey, helps me a lot with them. And then Aubrey planted um, things in the garden last year. He has stuff I planted over there right now. And my phone could ring. I forgot to turn it on silent while I'm sitting here because I'm trying to get the little tiller fixed and, <laughs> and so he can use that. And I, I yeah. forgot I, this guy was, uh, well, Bill was supposed to call me back. Yeah. Well, um, you had the best this. blueberries. Yes. Yeah. And, and yeah. y'all raised, um, you would do the cornmeal and the Joe mm -hmm. Tracks grits for yes. years. Yes, and he that just, was yeah. And that, yeah. Was, that came from his upbringing. Okay. Um, they always raised their corn. Mm -hmm. And of course, they had the mule that they plowed. And the mule needed something to eat in the wintertime and summertime, too. Of course, the grass wasn't you know, available in the summertime. And they didn't raise hay uh, or anything like that, but they would raise the corn and they would shell it for the animals. They had milk cows, uh, a milk cow, and chickens and things like that. And uh, they would take their corn and they would take their, select their best corn and they would uh, shell it and take it up to the mill. And I've forgotten the name of it. It's right up there where Blythewood and Farms is now. That was where the grist mill was that they took their corn to have ground. Oh, I don't know how he powered it. I can't remember the name of it though, but I don't remember how they powered it. I remember Daddy taking some up there as well. Uh, but Joe would, they would take it up every year and have it ground into grits of meal. Mm -hmm. And he just loved that. So when he, he decided, I want to grind my own grits of meal. So we went on vacation one time, he and I did, and we went up. He says, let's go through uh, uh, Wilkesboro and I want to see the grist mill up there. Well, we went up there to look at the grist mill and I went uh, on. And we looked at it and we saw it and we liked it and we came back to the motel about a half an hour or so away and we got up the next morning and said something, you sure you didn't like that grist mill? I said, we're going back for it, aren't we? He said, yeah, we're going back. <laughs> <laughs> so That's we great. went up there and bought a small one. Mm -hmm. Well, he bought a, a, a big round thing and it was a sifter. Mm -hmm. And he would, uh, he said, I've got to try it this see how this works to separate my meal from my grits. Mm -hmm. He got in a hotel room 
and he was sick with that stuff. He had he had cornmeal all over the hotel room, uh, and he just couldn't wait till he got home. He had, he had had them grind some of his corn while he was there. Mm -hmm. They had told him they would, and he got in there with that sifter, and he was just a sift in this cornmeal. <laughs> and I said, I thought the maid's gonna really like you. Yes, when I was a little girl, um, my mother and daddy had a house right beside my grandparents. Mm -hmm. One sister, my mother's sister, lived on the other side, and we lived on one side of my grandparents. And um, they were going to build onto our house, and we wouldn't stay at the Porsche house while they built onto that house. And I passed that house now a lot of times. I have the kids with me, and said, that's where I stayed. Oh, yeah. You know, just for a short period of time, just while they were doing some remodeling on our house. Right, that's, that's super neat. Yeah. Um, so one final question. What would you like to tell your great-grands? Uh, what would I like to tell my great-grands? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, as far as uh, about the community? Yes. Okay. Yes. And growing up as a woman and, and all that. So. Okay. I would tell them that I have never felt inferior to men mm -hmm. and that I've always felt um, that I'm the old school now. I've always felt that a woman should take care of her husband and of course he should take care of her as well. Mm -hmm. But um, I would tell them to do the cooking and everything that you can and let this man get outside and do some work. That's <laughs> one thing I would tell them. But I would also tell them to um, be kind mm -hmm. and to always um, Never look at the negative side, and look at the positive side. Mm -hmm. uh, that's something that's hard to keep children right now with all that's going on in the world. Uh, but I would tell them to be proud of themselves and accomplish anything they want to, mm -hmm. as long as they are willing to work for Thank you. You did a great job. Thank you. And there's a little bit of a pattern here. so. Both ladies have spoke about being kind to one another, right? Yes, <laughs> yes. So, which is great. Um, does anyone have a question for Ms. Barthian? I miss where the grist mill was in Blythewood. Where was the grist mill? Not Joe's. The one All right, that uh, and I said the Blythewood farm, but it's actually, can y'all hear me? It's actually the farm at, on what they call the farm of Ridgeway. It was right there on that property, on that curve. Did but. I, but I can't think of what the name is. Does anyone here remember what it was? But I would like to make a comment. Cretia's service station could not have run without Boise Palmer. We knew him better than we knew Mr. Creech, really, because he's the one that took care of all of us that needed to be taken care of. So I was sitting there thinking of that as y'all were talking. Thank you, Ms. Martin. Okay. All right. And then anyone, any other questions? I have a question. Did you, I say you lived in the Porsche house. I, yeah. where, where was it? I that's my that's that's it. my son. You've missed that story, okay? Yeah. <laughs> when you go across Porsche Road from our from your house, to go on the curve and on the right is a house, a brick house, and that's the Porsche house. The first house on the right. Yeah. That's a brick house. Yes. Okay, I'll pay more attention. To okay. <laughs> and I rode by it the other day. They're putting up fencing yeah. all around yeah. it. So. And then you can spot it. And you actually grew up just not even a mile up the road here yes. on Wilson Boulevard. So. Yeah, exactly. I lived, uh, a matter of fact, from the, the traffic light was uh, where the traffic light is now was a mile, but we didn't have traffic lights when I, we were growing up. Mm -hmm. Any of the three of us here, we didn't have traffic lights. Yeah. When it came to town, my and our entertainment was that when they finally put a traffic light up, can you hear me? Uh, that was our entertainment we used to joke about. We used to set up at Mr. Sharp's station and watch the traffic light change. <laughs> Y'all, I studied Dr. Portia, and the, the Historical Society toured that brick house as one of the uh, events that we had for the Historical Society maybe five years ago. That was the first brick house built in the Blakewood area. And uh, anyway, there are wonderful stories about that house. It had a windmill and a chicken coop or, or something, or duck, ducks, they raise ducks in the back. That's a wonderful house. You know more about it than I do, but it was fun to study up on that. Um, anyway. Yeah. I'd like to ask if she's related, if she's related to the other Browns. Repeat the question. Um. Are you related to the other Branhams? Uh, like Curtis Branham that lives south of Blythewood? Yes, all of them. We're related somehow. Matter of fact, my husband and I are related. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I went, 
I will tell you this, some, I did, we didn't know we were related, but his mother was a Branham, so I should have known that we were, had to be related somewhere. But someone asked us later on when we found out that we were related, well, what was going to happen, what, how was that going to affect our children? I said, it already has. <laughs> All right, so, Ms. Riley, um, tell us about you. What, who were you when you were a little girl growing up? Who were your parents and where did you live? Well, I was born at Wallaceville, as you said, and my parents were Joseph Elias Turkett, and my mother was Maddie Simmons from Virginia. And pronounce Turkett. Make sure I'm pronouncing it right. Yes. I am. Well, it's pronounced different ways, but that's the preferred. Is Turquette. Turquette, all right. And Wallaceville, where is Wallaceville, South well, Carolina? Wallaceville is off to the left of Highway 215 going north. It was a train stop for and a post office there. And that was where my father picked up the mail to carry around his route. And your father was a mail carrier? He was a mail carrier. Your father comes from a long family of Turquettes, is that right? Yes. Where are most of them buried, Ms. Riley? Well, the original ones are buried right in Blythewood. Which, which church? At Sandy Level, mm -hmm. right to the left of Sandy Level. Some of the first graves on the left would be Turner, Turkett, and Delala, Turkett, his wife. And your, your parents were living in Wallaceville when you were born, or is that where you grew up? Yes, my parents were there. My daddy went to Virginia and got my mother. And brought her back to, to her near Blackwood. To near the Blackwood. Red Hills of Pathville. You had um, brothers and sisters? A lot. Two of them are still alive. Yes. Tell us about your brothers and sisters. Well, I had three older brothers. William Paul, Joseph Reynolds, and Curtis Carroll. And... Uh, they all went to the University of South Carolina, and I had two older sisters, Lillian, and she went to Drones Business College, and Caroline went to Winthrop. And there was never any question about if you go to college, it was when you go to college. And so when I finished uh, Jenkinsville, uh, I did get a park scholarship to Newberry, but it was not the amount of money that would get me there for the entire year. So I got some work scholarships at University of South Carolina. How old were you when you graduated from high school, Ms. Riley? I was 15. 15 years old. That's 11 grades, I think you confessed a few minutes ago. Yeah. How high? How, what was your class rank when you graduated? I was valedictorian. Valedictorian at age 15 from a high school. Is that right, Ms. Riley? That's right. And you met your husband here in Blythewood, but yes. that was in high school when you were about 14 or 15 years old, I would imagine. Well, I was probably 11 or 12. Okay, all right. But I met him. But then you came across him again later on in life. Tell oh, us yes. about that. We, we were old. Well, he went to see me graduate from Jenkinsville, but then he went over to the Army, and I went off to college. And we, he was gone almost four years. And uh, I saw him the first night he came home, but of course, we had been apart so long, we weren't really very close at that. We were just friends. And. Uh, Later on, we dated seriously, and I married him in 1949. Where did y'all live when you got married, Ms. Riley? We lived in the old Turquette house for two years. Where is the old Turquette house? It's uh, west of Blythewood. Is that on Wildflower on Road? Wildflower Road, mm -hmm. just about a half a mile off. Well, so, off, huh? if you're on yeah. Highway 321 and yeah. you're heading west, away from Blythewood, yeah. it would be about a half a mile on the left? Yeah. It's six tenths of a mile. We have, what did you major in? I majored in English, an elementary ed, and a minor in French. Do you still speak French, Ms. Riley? No, I can read a few words. <laughs> what year did you graduate from the university? 
I graduated in August of 41. Before, we'll pick up with August of 41 in just a second, but. No, I, I graduated in I'm August. Sorry. Part right, graduate, 40, and then you, then you started teaching. I went in 41, and I graduated in 44. Thank you. When did you start teaching at Blythewood School? 1949, when I married Richard Riley. What um, grade did you teach? <laughs> well, the only grade they had open was a third grade. Well, what's wrong with third grade, Ms. Riley? Well, that's a different ball game from first and second, <laughs> really. Why? Well, the subject matter is a lot harder, and you have homework <laughs> in the third grade. You don't have much in the first and second. I mean, when you go home in the first grade, you're probably given a little mimeograph sheet with a story on it, but it uses all the words that you've just learned up to that point, that no new words. You just go home and read to your parents over that sheet for the story, a new rule. But when you're in third grade, you go home to actually study lessons and do projects in social studies and things like that. Did you then teach another grade the next year? Or did you switch to first grade right after that? I taught third grade and I'm Mr. Ora asked me to go up to the fourth grade with that same class, and we moved across the hall. And so some students were astonished when they came <laughs> and found I was the teacher. But then that next year, we had two more new students that year. But that's all. And I think you told me the size of your class was pretty big. It was 46 students that year. That's a lot of students. So for about, there are people who had you for two whole years in elementary school here in Blythewood. There were. And that would have been the years 1949 and 1950 that these children were in um, yes. third and fourth grades. The, the third year that I taught at Blythewood, the teach, first grade teacher retired. And you finally got to teach first and grade. I finally yeah. got to teach first grade. But then I quit. Oh. <laughs> to have my own family. Well, I, what were the rules back in those days, Ms. Riley, about being a pregnant school teacher? Well, you weren't supposed to te teach past the third month. That... And did you did you abide by those rules, Ms. Riley? Oh, yes, I did. But I, you had I, some, you had more than one child. I stayed out and had three children. And I, then you came back. I went back when the youngest child was in the second grade. The first grade teacher dropped dead a week before school was to start. So what'd you do? And Mr. Roller pleaded with me to come back. I told him I couldn't come back. My mother-in-law was old and I had to look after her. But she didn't die until after I retired. Years and years and years later. Her health was unusually good. And you... so I did come back and I, I stayed on. I went back to Columbia College for summer school and afternoon and evening classes to keep my certificate in force. What year did you finally retire as a first grade teacher at Blythewood? 1985. 1985, you think? Yeah. The day after my birthday, they told me to do that so that the next year you got yearly raises the 1st of July. My birthday was the 27th of June, so that meant I would get a raise the very next year. That was the advice they have given me. Well, that was good advice, Ms. Riley. I understand that in 1970, the Blythewood schools integrated. So did you meet some new teachers when Bethel came over to Blythewood? Yes. Who do you remember most? Lucille Lewis. What do you remember she, about her and what she you, was a wonderful teacher. What made her a wonderful teacher? She had perfect control of those children. They worked quietly. She worked diligently. She could invent things for them to do. Uh, if it was covered coat hangers with yarn, or it would be eggshells that were dyed and mo made mosaic pictures with them. After integration, how did your students do? Did they do just as well as they had before, or was it a change? Was it different uh, between 1970 and when you retired? By the time I retired, yes, 
there were too many divorces and too many children going away on every other weekend for the visit to other parent. And on Friday, they were looking out the window thinking about what they were going to do that weekend. And on Monday, when they came back, they were out of sorts too. It was very hard for some children. And we're not talking about high school students. We're talking about your first grade I'm, students. I'm talking about first grade children. So the family is pretty important to, Fam to education? Family is very important. Can you think of any other changes that happened for better or for worse between 1970 and when you graduated? Well, the, the schools, a lot of them were really made better and uh, we got more high schools and the transportation was still okay. I didn't think that I complained before. I walked to schools sometimes. <laughs> I'm going to tell Bob something first. Okay. <laughs> Bob asked me if I had ever taught anybody, politician or anybody that was famous. I told him, not that I knew of, but I did teach a missionary. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy Lauren is a retired missionary. That, that's not who I thought you were talking about. How about the blind guy who went to the Philippines? Oh, that, <laughs> that was, that was Dr. Lyon. Oh, right. Yes, that was Dr. Lyon. I used to read his history lessons to him. He was blind, and I read his history lessons to him at lunchtime because I lived in Eau Claire and rode the bus to Carolina, and he lived in West Columbia, and he rode the bus so we didn't go home for dinner. We ate our lunch, and I'd meet him in the library and read to him, and he would make his notes in Braille with his stylus. And, so, and he, he became a doctor of education and a missionary to the blind and has a notable past <laughs> to record. Thanks to Ms. Riley, he was uh, educated enough to translate the entire Bible into Filipino or whatever the language is there. But now, I gotta ask this. Well, maybe y'all should guess. Ms. Riley played a sport in high school. She was great. What sport do you think Miss Riley taught when she was at high school? Basketball. <laughs> she lower than my arm. You played point guard, didn't you? No. No. Yeah, I finished it. Thank yeah. God. But I'm so old that we played three division. We had guards, and we had the middle section, and then we had the people shooting the baskets. I played the middle section <laughs> the first couple of years. And I couldn't play in the tournament because I wasn't 12 years old. <laughs> <laughs> one, one, I, let me say this too. The, I really interviewed Ms. Wilson and Ms. Riley, and they were the ones I spent most time with. And the trouble I had with, these, with my two ladies, as I call them, is I would ask them questions and they would invariably talk about other people not so much themselves, and it was hard to get them to talk about themselves. It really was. So when Martha edited the videos way down, I think a large part was to get rid of the talk about other people and to keep the stuff of what we were interviewing them for. And I thought that was remarkable. You ask Ms. Riley anything and she'll change the subject to somebody else. <laughs> oh, and another thing too Ms. Wilson has in common with you is both of y'all got scholarships to a college that you could not go to because you could not afford to go to college even on that scholarship. Right. Ms. Wilson, remind us, what was the college you got your, um, your, your uh, scholarship to? Duke University. Duke University. There are a few people who think that's a better college than South Carolina. I think they're wrong, but it's nonetheless a good university. All right, so... I know we got questions. Um, is David over, overly here? Oh, oh, that's you. Good. Stand up. <laughs> Tell us who you are and why you're here, David. Um, I'm sorry, it's Polly. Yeah, I'm, I'm here as a former student at Miss Raleigh. And through my whole life, I have remembered Miss Raleigh. I can't remember a single teacher's name, I, I'm sorry to say that, from Blythewood Elementary, except Miss Raleigh. Yeah. And there was something about Miss Raleigh as a teacher. You know, you said she was tough on us, but there was something about Miss Riley just, you didn't want to be bad. 
she made you want to be a good person without, you know, anything she had to go beyond. It's just, you want to be a good person to please her. And I'm, I'm proud to say when she talks about how her students have not been in, in trouble, I think that's a great testament to people like Ms. Riley. And we owe a lot to you, Ms. Riley, and we'll always remember you. The way she put it to me was, she, she when she, I'm sorry, y'all, but she, um, she never found the name of one of her students in the newspaper as having done anything wrong. And I'm not sure anybody can say that except for a, a teacher from Blythewood. Is that fair to say you've never read about one of your students in the criminal pages and the whatever you call it? Yeah, right. Okay, I know there are more questions. I'm terribly sorry about this, this microphone. Um, I know there are more questions out here. So. I'm used to talking loud. <laughs> you've had some experience with that. Yeah. But unlike a lot of kids, you're, I mean, a lot of teachers, you don't have, you didn't have to talk as loud as some teachers might, because your students knew what would happen if they spoke too loud. Well, the principal's daughter told me I would make a good librarian because I talked so softly. <laughs> what else? What else? Martha had the job of um, editing these videos down. I'm glad it wasn't me because um, she had to yes. cut out a whole bunch of stuff for us to make the program doable. Um, any more questions? I know there's a lot from Ms. Yes, sir. I'd like to know if, if she's related to Cecil David or Dean Riley. Is she related to Cecil David or Dean Riley? They were my husband's nephews. Thank you. He said, my I can see my husband was Richard. He was next to the oldest. Edwin was the oldest and Richard. And I met Richard over here playing basketball in this gym. Because she went to Jenkinsville High School, yeah. valedictorian at age 15. I'm glad you didn't cut that out, Mark. That was <laughs> he said it was a pleasure to have met you. Thank you. I'm uh, Margaret Kelly. I will tell that children. I, I, I will tell Cecil's son, Dean, when I see him. Right. And tell us your name, sir. Jim Crosby. Jim Crosby. Well, thank you. Thank you. Again, donations accepted for a new PAC. <laughs> All right, Margaret, you had a question? I just wanted to ask Ms. Riley, how many years were you married to your husband, Richard? How long were you married to your husband, Richard? Uh, 61 years. Wow. Right. Can we ask how old you are? How many people that you live by yourself still? Yes. Is it a secret, Ms. Riley, that you live by yourself still? No, I live by myself with the, with the help of my daughter and my son and, and his wife and her husband. Her husband, Fusma Birds, and Jean and his wife buy my groceries and bring them in and put them up high. Well, and he trims the yard and helps me with the flower house. <laughs> And I have another son, but he lives in Mississippi. He's a preacher in Mississippi and works down there for Lowe's. So we're not supposed to ask a woman how old you are. Well, Can I ask you? I'm 97, pressing 98 in June. Okay. If it comes on, it comes on. I just can't stand to sit here and not claim Kim, essentially with Francis. I went to school with her younger sister and knew the Turkets all my life and loved them. There were no other smarter girls anywhere around than these Turkets. So. Thank you. And I didn't know any of the boys. They were too old for me. But, uh, but I, went to, I went to school all my life with her sister, Dessa. Yes, Dessa is still living in the Presbyterian home. Would be here. And no, she's really not able to get around too well. But uh, she was smarter. She made cum laude on her grudge. I missed it by 19 hundredths of a point. Oh. <laughs> and my older sister, Caroline, made the strawberry leaf at winter. We, we used to work so hard to make Dessa uh, behave bad. <laughs> hey, Bessie, cut, Bessie cut up. 
I'll tell her you were here today. <laughs> we talked every sometimes night. Sometimes we were successful and sometimes we were, but we couldn't stand for being the best, you know, the, the best child in the class. She calls me every night and we chat every night. And my, my brothers, the oldest one was a chemical engineer and his son was a chemical engineer and his granddaughter was a chemical engineer all from the university, so our blood runs garnet, except, <laughs> except for that sister that went to Wilton and married that Clemson man. <laughs> so sorry, so sorry. <laughs> Those are the fun things that I'm, yes. Is Dessa younger or older than you? Younger. Dessa. Yes. Is Dessa older or younger? Yes, yes, yes is much younger than I am. She's almost five years younger than I am. She'll have a birthday in April. She'll be 93. Caroline will be 104 in April. We plan to celebrate. <laughs> I will tell her you asked about her. Is there Anybody? any more questions? I was going to ask, do you have any, what memories do you have of World War II? Oh, well, for one thing, you, you don't want to buy anything made of rayon because we had to substitute rayon for silk. The, the Japanese had furnished us silk. We no longer could get silk stockings. We had to have rayon stockings. And they would bag down on your legs, they wouldn't stay up. And if you got wet in the rain, the dress tails, if you, I had them a raincoat standing at the bus stop, and the wind blew it open, and the rain wet my bus tail, and there was my dress freaking up. <laughs> <laughs> and I was embarrassed to go to that event that I had to go to. So you never want anything more right on after that. But um, my husband was in service for almost four years over in Italy. But he, he was in the engineers in charge of the um, wire and the grates that they made the bridges with and that type of stuff. He was a sergeant and over a bunch of men with that. So he was actually never on the front but he was in danger of being blown up just the same because they wanted to get rid of that depot. Any more questions? Okay, one more. <laughs> my, wife, my wife is a second year teacher now, so what advice would you give to her as to be a good teacher like you? Just tell her to love them. <laughs> just love them. I know they don't let you pat them on the shoulder anymore and hug them like you want to do. But uh, I loved them, and they loved me in return, I hope. Oh, yeah. And uh, like I said, I do, do have one missionary to my credit that I told in the first one. <laughs> good, good, good. And, and she was an inspiration to her little cousin, the boy that was in there, because he wasn't going to let that girl get ahead of him, and he started to make all these, too. <laughs> So you just never know when you get one new child, you don't get one new thing. You get one child and how he reacts to every other child in that room. So you get a whole bunch of problems sometimes, but they, they usually work out. And if they were good like David, they turn out all right. <laughs> I want y'all to and, do something. And her husband too, I told Clarence, and he was a good person. I, I couldn't see all those hands that went up back there for those I taught, but I'm glad I had you. <laughs> One thing, I, I asked her how things changed between 1970 and 1985, thinking the answer would have something to do with race relations. She didn't say that at all. She picked, she, what she said was families changed so that when you would not have, you, so that there were fewer families with two parents at home. And that made a huge difference so that they would go, they would look forward to the weekend and then come back after having had a weekend with a different parent. I don't know if y'all picked up on that, but I thought that was very significant what she said. 
And then Martha's got an announcement about food, I think, but I'm not real sure. And the Baptists would have choir practice on Wednesday night, and the Methodists had choir practice on Thursday night. So when were we supposed to give that spelling test? <laughs> 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 thank you, ladies. I did want to say um, um, thank you so much for having this event. And that I think it's, I don't need it. Okay. Thank you. I think, I think it's I in a, like we're in a, going in a step in the right direction when we begin to do these type of relational events. And that we have an opportunity to to join together. Because I, too, was a student of Miss Riley, and most of my family were. You know, we walked to school from up the street. And we had a lot of, um, my aunt is like the second year of segregated in Spring Valley, and I graduated from Spring Valley, and some graduated from different places, but I've seen a lot change in Blythewood. I remember the roads being dirt roads, because we were, we were raised there. I remember when the big trucks and all those things. I remember when McDonald's was built, and you know, and, and the people that live here, and going to Roger Wilson, there's a lot of memories. Well, one of the things that I see, and I would ask anybody who got this, this question, I see the face of Blackwood changing. You know, not just because we've changed and we've grown and we are older. As people come in, and I, I always say those people, because when we were growing up, we saw the older people coming up the road doing 15 with the signal light on. No, he wasn't going left, even though the signal light was on going left. And we didn't blow the horn. So some of the things I think that we want to keep are, you know, is the respect that we have for our older people, El older being, you know, a little bit older, still driving, but those things that when northerners come in, they don't get. We need to do some Blackwood training, you know. <laughs> we, need, we need to keep the older stuff. We need yeah. to keep the respect for our our people and our older people and our town and that kind of thing. We don't have that. So I think one of the things to me that stuck out, you know. My mom was talking, I saw the whole video. I watched the video initially. And I really appreciated, you know, the different things that came out today that we did not know. So I really appreciate those things. Because I remember, I didn't know it was Creech Station. You know, we just knew it was the Gulf. And, you know, at that time, it was the Hay Goods. And we got big popsicles there. But I think it's a, a, it's a great idea. And I applaud you guys for having this, that we need more of it. I just wanted to say thank you for having us and, and my mom, because today is her 47th anniversary, my dad. And, um, you know, it's me. I give my you know, It's a lot. You know, yes. the relations are a lot. The race relations are a lot. And in Blackwood, I think we've done a lot better of trying to cultivate a positive atmosphere mm -hmm. than a lot of other places. So exactly. I appreciate that and this. Yes. Thank you so much for saying that. We just we wanted to share with um, Ms. Riley that we met in her class. <laughs> and that we were in the first grade and he was the quiet one. Whatever. And I was not the troublemaker. The troublemaker, he says. And because we were talking, we got paddled at that time, back when we were going to school, we got paddled because we, we, he was talking and I was a quiet one. And so that's how we met. Fast forward to 27 years ago, we, we got married and we always talk about... A story of me getting paddled in Miss Riley's class. <laughs> getting paddled in her class. <laughs> so we were here just to get Miss Riley back. Just kidding. <laughs> But we enjoyed it, and I'm really appreciative of the Historical Society for allowing us the opportunity to come and share in this event. So, with that being said, thank you. What else, babe? Enjoyed it very much. Uh, a lot of things about life here that I didn't know that was brought up. Right, today. right. We didn't know, but we learned, and we're willing to learn some other things. So, we appreciate that. So we are so glad and we so glad to see you. Oh, and I'm we appreciate I'm you. I'll apologize now. <laughs> it's, too it's, too, it's too late. It's too late. It's too late. It was worth every bit. It was worth every bit. And we appreciated that. Yeah.
I, I enjoyed hearing the three stories today, and I encourage people to learn more about the people in the past. Uh, talk to the people who are still around so you can learn about what it used to be like, and, and so to know where you're going, you have to know where you've been. So things like, things like this were really great, and I encourage more people to come out and visit the museum. There's a lot of interesting stuff here that I've learned about just from being here for a couple hours. But um, yeah, the presentation was great, and, and I hope there's more of that. Hi, I'm Margaret Kelly. I'm the Administrative Assistant at Blythewood Historical Society and Museum. And this is the second time we've actually had a women's history celebration. And this was the best turnout ever. And I do believe it's because we centered on specific women who made a difference in Blythewood and their families came and celebrated with them. Um, we're so appreciative for all the families for being here, Town of Blythewood for helping us out with this event, and for all the people who helped out. And we'll have the oral histories on our website, on YouTube, so we hope that you'll enjoy them and see them again, and come to the museum to see all that we have to offer here. Thank you.